Um, so I want to, to uh, boost child um, and youth and advocacy centers. Uh, good afternoon, centers. Uh, good afternoon to those from Ontario to the east, and good morning to those still from uh, Ontario to the west. My name is Rachel Birnbaum, um, and I just want to take care of a few housekeeping uh, issues first. As you can probably tell at the bottom left, you will see uh, for those participants who want to listen and read the PowerPoint in French, just click on the floor at the bottom left and with um, the screen and select French. And for those um, who are going to be listening and reading in English, uh, do the same thing at the bottom where it says floor and in English. Um, feel free to download the presentation um, in both French and English. If you can't see me, it's because this is an audio presentation only. Um, I'm going to be taking questions and answering as many questions that I can um, with the last do submit your questions. And you just go to the toolbar and click on messaging and then participants type in your question and I will uh, certainly answer it. If I haven't answered your question, uh, please feel free to email me. It's on the, um, I'm easy to find in, uh, at, uh, at King's University College in, uh, at Western. And if you're watching this webinar in a group, please do enter the number of participants in the group by uh, clicking on messaging and then the participants. So today's presentation is working with and understanding high conflict separated families, the challenges and the opportunities. Um, I called it challenges as well as opportunities because it's not all bad news. There's good news as well. And it, there's also opportunities, particularly with separated families um, who, uh, who are having some, some issues and, some, and need some assistance. So the goals for this presentation need some assistance. So the goals for this presentation are to understand some of the literature about high conflict families, and that's the myths as well as the realities. Um, understanding the different types of services um, and interventions uh, working with high conflict families. So what's working and what does not. Every province and territory has many different government uh, services for, for separated families from information sessions to mediation sessions. And some of these services are helpful and some of them um, are, uh, may not work so well for some particular families. So there's an also an understanding of the need for some early intervention and interdisciplinary collaboration within the justice uh, professionals. Um, I'm a firm believer that it's not just social workers and youth workers, uh, lawyers, uh, judges with working with some of these um, families. So let's talk about some of the definitions or some of the difficulties in the use of uh, even the language called high conflict. Uh, believe it or not, even in 2019, there still remains uh, no clear, really working definition of high conflict. And the difficulty is so that it's difficult to assess and it would be difficult to identify and it limits kind of effective interventions because we don't have sort of a, um, a one a perception or an, a, a good understanding of what high conflict families are. There's also a lack of consensus on the uh, predictive factors. So what are the factors, whether it's violence, whether it's poor communication, whether it's um, poor problem solving. Um, we have, they're scattered all over the different social sciences as well as legal journals and they're very unorganized and the terminology and they're very unorganized and the terminology is um, very inconsistent. So what a youth and child worker might have to define as families that are having difficulties and call them high conflict may be very different the way a social worker looks at it and says, no, this is a family where there's a lot of alienation, a child who refuses to visit one parent or another. And at the end, you've got parents, the lawyers and the judges, um, as well as mental health professionals um, using this term, and they might mean quite different things, which then leads to a lot of negative consequences for parent-child relationships, because you're, you're not, not everybody's looking at the same thing and having an understanding that they're all on the same page with. So 
what happens so when that happens it's the quality of the post-divorce relationship between the parents is a critical factor in both children and parents adjustment by conflict situation we do know that there are negative implications with respect to children's adjustment uh, post-separation. So what are some of these characteristics? Um, well, they're involved, uh, the parents are typically involved in protracted litigation for over three years. I know in when I do some uh, private work, I get boxes, bankers boxes, um, you know, three, four at a time. And then I know that I'm dealing with a family that's obviously been involved in a lot of litigation and there may be a very different understanding of what's going on. They're involved with a multitude of professionals and agencies. Um, most notably, um, you know, everyone's sort of invited to the party, whether it's child welfare, whether it's the police, whether it's sending children to medical professionals, um, it's getting everybody involved. Um, and then there's uh, the professionals are then fired. Um, lawyers get fired. It's not uncommon on many of these cases involved. Um, and then there's uh, the professionals are then fired. Um, lawyers get fired. It's not uncommon on many of these cases where, you know, families, uh, a parent is on their third or their fourth lawyer, um, their third or their fourth uh, mental health professional with respect to. Um, being able to help them or not, and it's always the same issue with respect to, you know, when you start hearing you're the you're you're the only professional that's ever you know sort of listened to me, um, then you know that you're there's going to be some problems. It's not a, it's not a good sign. <laughs> um, then there's the bias, the concerns of 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 the judge as well. There are many um, more and more referrals are being made to the judicial council uh, because uh, there are more and more self-represented litigants coming before the court. And they're also challenging that the, the judge is obviously biased. You know, he only cares about women or they only care about men or this is only about, you know, uh, or views of the child reports as well as an assessment or child legal representation. If you're, um, if you're fortunate enough to be in a province where there is child uh, representation program. And then there's a number of critiques and challenges to those assessments. Um, where again, the professionals' um, complaints are being made to the regulatory bodies of either the social worker or the psychologist um, or other mental health professionals. There are often repeated allegations of child uh, maltreatment. And, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because it could be that the um, allegations are true, but they can't be proven. Um, it could be that the parent truly believes there's something going on um, and is making the complaint. And it could be that there are mental health concerns about a parent and that's why they're making um, the complaints. At the end of the day, the children are the ones that are experiencing and that's why they're making um, the complaints. At the end of the day, the children are the ones that are experiencing the um, uh, negative uh, implications in terms of their psycho-emotional uh, needs. And if anybody uh, more on these issues with respect to character, uh, the, some of the characteristics of these families, I mean, Janet Johnson, who's a sociologist in California, really coined that phrase, high conflict families, in the early 90s. And um, it's been now taken on and sort of uh, can still use, but there's, you know, but there's still a lot of uh, dynamics that are going around. So there are, to date, there's about 16 studies that have looked at this whole issue around um, high conflict families. Um, there's been three since in uh, 2019, mostly government reports. Um, and as you can see, um, I wrote with uh, my colleagues on this as well, and I'll talk later about a tool that we developed to help identify or at least pinpoint um, in, a, in a more um, efficient way in terms of what some of these families are. But you can see that all in all, there's not, you know, there's not a whole lot of studies um, that have been done on this issue. And you'll see as I go on that there's not a whole still... Uh, not a really good, reliable, valid way of um, how, to, how to recognize these families and then develop interventions for them. Um, my colleague and I recognize these families and then develop interventions for them. Um, my colleague and I in 2010 
um, we did a study of the case law and looked at all the um, legal cases that we could find from, and at that time it was 1988 to 2009, and we only found about 500 cases. Um, I, I will tell you that I'm working on a project now with child welfare in Ontario, um, and we're re-examining the literature to see how often that phrase is being used in parenting disputes as well as child welfare, and we've already reached uh, double that amount. Um, but at that time, the, they were defined, they were characterized by a lot of distrust and anger. A lot of them went and used the court system uh, to sometimes to exact revenge on their partner, sometimes to uh, change the way things are going on. That might not seem like a long time, but for on uh, from a child's point of view, that certainly is an eternity to be involved with your parents disputing about you, particularly if you're a, if you're a young child. And some of these continue until the children um, are adults. I do a lot of studies where I'm interviewing young adults, and they still talk about their parents who were involved with court and the litigation. There's also different and overlapping situations of high conflict, and they present a range of legal issues in varying contexts. Um, two thirds of them were bilateral, um, what, meaning that both parents are warning, are warring, and often they are both have personality um, difficulties. And about a third of them are unilateral, so you need to support the more reasonable parent um, to stay involved so that the child does continue to have a relationship with that other with that other parent. The child does continue to have a relationship with that other with that other parent. Now conflict is not unilateral, but it may be. Um, as I said earlier, the more disturbed party may provoke an unreasonable response, and that in turn sets up the other parent, and then away you go to the races. And you always need to think about there's always a child that is either not being heard um, or if, if there are no professionals involved in that family or is under extreme stress and uh, child welfare may need to get involved. Um, there's a need for a systems perspective on how conflict is being encouraged and maintained by others. You know, we professionals, we like to think that we're helping families, but sometimes we actually um, make things a bit worse by um, offering advice or sending families to services that in fact may not be helpful to them at all, or we take sides and we them at all, or we take sides and we advocate for a particular parent and child, um, which might be the role in therapy, but it's certainly not the role when you're doing an assessment or working in a more forensic setting such as the, such as the court. Um, so some of the consequences for parents, it's their emotional and psychological um, well-being, and it creates parenting problems. Um, they are not able, and it limits their ability then to be attuned to their child uh, because they're constantly thinking about what's the next thing that we have to do for court, what's the next, you know, I have to monitor to make sure that my child, and they're not as attuned to their child as they really should be. Children, of course, are under extreme stress. Um, they tend to, uh, you'll typically find them at school. And it, again, it's by gender, you know, where boys are extreme, become extreme loss of appetite. Um, and there's uh, often these children are feeling extreme guilt and not knowing what to do about it and helplessness in these particular uh, family dynamics. So let's talk a little bit about the myths and realities about who they are. Well, they're not, they're not necessarily low-income people. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of high-conflict families are extremely affluent. They're extremely verbal. Um, they have access to a lot of resources. As I said earlier, they fire and hire assessors, um, other mental health professionals, lawyers. Um, they're certainly not disempowered in any way, and they're fervent in their belief that um, some injustice has been done to them, and they want, and they think that the court system is going to somehow um, vindicate them and give them what they want, that if they could only speak to the judge, the judge will know exactly what they're saying and uh, will do exactly what they're saying and uh, will do exactly what they want. Um, you know, we liken them to, they're conflict junkies. 
they um, they live and breathe in this world of uh, creating what's the next problem that they're going to uh, that they're going to create without sometimes looking at um, themselves in terms of where what role they're playing um, with respect to all of this. They certainly engage um, in every part of the legal system, as you can uh, as you can imagine. Um, the parenting disputes, while they're in family court, is the primary battlefield. There's also often um, criminal proceedings that are going on. Um, there could very well be domestic violence um, concerns, and a uh, parent has been charged. More often than not, it's the it's um, fathers being charged with domestic violence and uh, and being asked to leave the house. There are child protection proceedings that are going on. Uh, children may also get themselves little proceedings and administrative tribunals such as the uh, Child and Family Services Review Board, uh, immigration and refugee could also be involved. So you can see that this is a very complex um, that needs, to, and that's why I said earlier, that needs to engage with a number of different disciplines uh, because often these families are involved with many, many different systems. I kind of liken high conflict families, to be quite frank, is that this is a public health crisis that has engaged every system imaginable. And if we don't um, assist um, uh, with helping these families get them on the right track, these children are uh, going to be repeating it um, as, as they get older. Um, family court agencies typically serve as the point of entry or the initial point of services for most of these parents with parenting um, disputes. And uh, the, most of these parents with parenting um, disputes. And uh, the staff have to be equipped to deal with a wide range of issues and um, various levels of conflict. Um, I don't, um, I, in Ontario, there's uh, very, very little legal aid. I know that the, a lot of that is happening right across Canada from coast to coast to coast. So a lot of these families are coming to court. They're angry. They don't understand the legal system. They can't. Uh, they don't understand how um, the application and the process. So the staff people are having to deal with a lot of these um, individuals, and it becomes a, a real challenge. But that not all conflict um, is also the same, and also, which is why you need to really be able to differentiate between the low, middle, uh, and and moderate and high conflict families. Um, one of the one of the concerns that I have is that sometimes high conflict gets um, confused high conflict family, but that is not the same as family violence in separated and divorced families. And there needs to be a real assessment about the safety risks to both parent and child. There also needs to be an assessment of the power imbalance between the victim and the offender. And this has um, uh, implications for, uh, you know, in interference in uh, custody, in decision making, and all, obviously on prolonged custody battles. And ADR professionals are not always understanding the uh, domestic abuse dynamics from the high conflict or have the ability to recognize it. So there's a lot of work being done now by many of my colleagues to try to not only just differentiate uh, family violence from high conflict, but also how to uh, promote more safe practices um, when uh, you're dealing with families who are separated. So right now, from coast to coast to practices, um, when uh, you're dealing with families who are separated. So right now, from coast to coast to coast, as I said, every province and territory has a number of government services, and they're pretty well a, a linear kind of service delivery model. So there's a continuum, they're made available in a linear fashion. So the families begin with the service that's least intrusive and time consuming, and if the dispute isn't resolved, then they move on to the next layer. And under this approach, each service tier is typically becomes much more intrusive and directive um, than the one preceding it. So a typical might, progression might be uh, divorce education programs or parent information programs, uh, mediation uh, to parenting evaluations, uh, voice, of the, voice of the child reports, um, in the clinical investigations moderated by settlement conferences and ultimately um, while they seem to be least intrusive to most intrusive, um, many of these families can be stuck 
in these different um, types of approaches that may not be necessarily beneficial for them. So while we have some excellent services such as parenting, coaching, uh, mediation, assessments, um, all the way down to supervised access, there needs to be a differentiated assessment approach to these families um, rather than just kind of um, throwing everything at them. Um, things need to be tried out very, very slowly to see whether in fact it helps. But there also needs to be a way of saying that if this is a high conflict family right from the beginning, it is not helpful to be putting them through mediation um, or putting them through parent coaching. Uh, perhaps the best thing is to go straight to having a trial and get the matter resolved as quickly. Uh, perhaps the best thing is to go straight to having a trial and get the matter resolved as quickly as possible. So not all of those services that I, that I just spoke about are necessarily geared to all levels of conflict. Um, the least intrusive to most intrusive sort of suggests that the um, higher conflict families must receive these services that don't work before they're able to receive more specialized services. And that's the problem with a lot of our services is that we don't know what's working and what isn't working because we also don't do we, we also don't do a very good job at doing any follow up. And these ineffective interventions are not only a waste of resources, um, but can result in escalating um, where the parties become even more polarized and they're getting angrier and angrier, um, which is why if we know that there is um, violence going on where, uh, and it's more and it's a serious, then it's more and it's a serious, then it should immediately be going to a trial or to a case management approach and not trying to work their, your way through sort of parenting and coaching and mediation, they're not really appropriate for those families. Um, so we, we're trying to move away from a one size fits all paradigm and that all conflict is negative. Um, there's going to always be conflict. I mean, there's conflict even in families who aren't separated or divorced. And, uh, but we need to provide a, a foundation for a better assessment of the appropriateness of the parenting plans for families that are experiencing different dimensions um, of conflict. Um, there's also, we need to do a better job at diminishing the gender wars about uh, gender and conflict um, with uh, real data and stories rather than just rhetoric about who's at fault. We also need to develop needs of families, and I'm going to be talking about those as we move on. So one kind of uh, differential approach is a triage that's used to determine the referral to the most appropriate service. So it's sitting down with each parent um, individually and collecting information about family violence, uh, the presence of protection orders, uh, criminal charges, uh, are there any mental health or substance abuse issues, um, as well as information about uh, legal proceedings aside from family proceedings. As I said earlier, a lot of these families are involved with other courts. Um, in Ontario, particularly here in Toronto, we have the Integrated Domestic Violence Court, which, um, which hears uh, both criminal and family matters that involve custody and access disputes at the same time. So that's one way of uh, doing a one way of uh, doing a triage with families where there is serious violence going on in the midst of a, um, a in the midst of a, a family dispute, um, and that we need to collect information about their ability to communicate and concerns about um, their uh, the parenting uh, that needs to also be solicited. So some of the assumptions of this differential response is there needs to be an early assessment by a court appointed mental health professional who has specialized knowledge. Um, Alberta has some excellent um, uh, high conflict programs that are dedicated um, to high conflict families um, and they, uh, they do extremely well. Also um, in terms of uh, family violence, as I said, and children who refuse to visit the other parent um, is highly desirable in terms of trying to um, differentiate what's really generally become more difficult to address with the passage of time. So if a child is already uh, not visiting a parent 
when the case is at the beginning, continuing to just allow them to languish in the system is not going to get any better for those children or for either of the, of the parents. And in fact, usually those children and parents likely to become more entrenched in their positions, and then it becomes more exacerbated by the litigation. So we need to have professionals in immediately um, to, for these early, uh, early assessment approaches. So the family justice services are going to depend on the level of interparental conflict, the degree of receptivity and responsiveness of both parents, not just one, the how intentional the parent behaviors are towards the other parent. Um, it also depends on the complexity in the stage of the case parent behaviors are towards the other parent. Um, it also depends on the complexity in the stage of the case. Um, if they've been in court for, you know, five to eight years, um, it, it really finally needs a trial and not to keep adjourning it or sending more professionals in, obviously. Then you need to look at the types of services that are available um, geared for these uh, different levels of conflict. And as I said, we have, we have a few of these services, but not enough that actually does a differential response. We've got a number of excellent community services in every single city um, and territory across this country. Um, but what's lacking is the ability to do an assessment at the beginning of these cases to know at what level of conflict you're actually looking at. So let me give you more models. So in California, years ago, there was an impasse-focused mediation model that was introduced. And that was a, more of where parents could sit down um, and you could work with a mediator um, and other professionals in terms of getting past whatever um, the issue was. Um, and that was one type of model that was being used as a, um, as a differential response for some families. Um, there, there was also another fast track service model for high conflict families and much of that is similar to in many ways to um, some of Alberta's program where it's, you know, targeted, um, the information is targeted specifically for high conflict families. Then there's also from in British Columbia, Ontario and Manitoba, a needs um, and focused assessments. In uh, Connecticut, they developed, uh, Robin Deutsch and her colleagues uh, developed the fam family service uh, civil aid. And I have the literature um, on all of these different approaches if people want to um, obtain a copy, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to send it to you. And then in Ontario with my colleagues a number of years ago, we developed a uh, dimensions of conflict where we worked with a number of different agencies across uh, Toronto actually, um, whether it was child welfare or child and youth services, uh, to help try to get a better understanding of what the dimensions are and now looking at um, going through uh, trying to rate them in terms of the families so that we can do a better differential assessment of where those families families are. So work is, is you know, slowly being developed. Um, it's just not being developed fast enough for a lot of these uh, for a lot of these families and the needs that they have. So the objective of a lot of these interventions obviously is to uh, reduce parental conflict and to promote um, healthy parent relationships. And it's trying to keep as much as possible children um, out of the middle of some difficult uh, parental interactions. Now, having said that, I don't mean that children should not be involved at all. Um, I truly believe that, um, and children want to be actually part of the process by being able to talk to somebody about it, um, whether that's through a views of the child report or a mediator coming in to interview children to help um, when their parents are being mediated, or if it has to go for an assessment that in fact um, the assessor speaks, um, speaks to the child uh, with respect to what some of these issues are. Um, also, there's conflict management for the parents, like how to manage um, cooperation and communication. And as many of you know, the, uh, which passed 
in this year will uh, begin in July 1st of 2020. So we're no longer looking at the language of custody and access, but we're talking about parenting plans and parenting time. And that, I think, is going to also increase a focus on some of these high conflict families who now may misunderstand that it somehow uh, so that that means that now we have shared parenting. And that's not what the legislation um, says at all. There's a lot of really good positive parenting programs that help assist with um, some of this conflict management and how to de-triangulate uh, tri de to remove children from the middle of this, but to still be allowed to have a voice um, in this process so that they can feel that they've got some sense of um, their voice being heard and what some of their needs are. And it helps them in terms of their own. They can feel that they've got some sense of um, their voice being heard and what some of their needs are. And it helps them in terms of their own um, coping skills as well. So some of the systemic in innovations, um, as I said, there's the uh, Toronto Integrated Domestic Violence Court, which I wrote a number of papers on, and I'm, I'm still doing some work, uh, be writing a, a few more, where I've done some interviews with, um, with the victims and the offenders. Um, and, you know, where they really talk about the impact that it's had on the children and the services that their children really need it. There's also the court process uh, coordinator in Moncton, and there's also case conferences, and this is looking at it where there's violence involved as well as case conferences in family court where the Crown and Child Protective Services are asked to attend if there's other proceedings. So from us, there's a lot of crossover and that they too need to um, intervene early, uh, but they need a lot of assistance from mental health professionals um, and certainly from a lot of um, uh, child and youth workers. So what are some of the benefits to this, um, to this collaboration? Well, it would certainly improve the working relationships and the understanding of these families. This is a systems problem. So, you know, the law cannot solve this on its own. Um, yes, you can go to court, but it's a rather blunt instrument that kind of all it does will give you an order, but there's nobody there to help implement that order um, or to improve the relationships between the, uh, between the parents so that children aren't caught in the middle. There needs to be more enhanced research and education between um, the disciplines, community partners, and academia. Um, I feel very privileged today, very privileged today to be able to presenting to all of you um, from coast to coast to coast in all your different agencies about this. And I think there needs to be more of this type of uh, presentations and collaboration, um, as well as uh, with policymakers as well. And it leads to more effective communication and collaboration in uh, program development. A number of years ago, um, I did work with policy with the Department of Justice by creating um, a high conflict curriculum and then went across the country to, to present it. And, you know, similar to what I'm doing right now, it's to continue that education um, between all of us um, and how much we really do need one another to be able to sort some of this out, to be able to really help families. So what does it mean? Well, here in Ontario, um, what's worked really well is we've had quite a um, we had um, where about uh, 35 to 40 agencies, um, yep, 35 to 40 agencies would get together uh, the workers and talk about what some of the issues that they're experiencing. Um, so a number of conferences were all, um, you know, sort of came from that, as well as a number of um, connections so that you knew who all the other professionals were in your field that you could actually reach out to. Um, to work with um, with some of these families. So we need to work better with lawyers that are representing the, the, the parties, um, certainly with uh, children's aid. As I said, um, I'm, we're doing a major project that's been funded by the Law Foundation here in Ontario on working with um, child welfare and mental health professionals to get a better understanding um, of how to how to work with these families, particularly when there are allegations of maltreatment, 
And while some may be verified, some are not verified, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And how, what do we do with those families? Um, you know, simply saying, well, you know, it's not verified, therefore we're not going to help, isn't answering that, uh, that problem either. There's also a better job with therapists. Um, therapy is, is great if you're working individually in counseling, but sometimes and therapists get a sense of they want to offer, they want to be the advocate for the parent, and they may end up creating more difficulties with themselves, um, for themselves, I should say. Also need a better job with um, child specialists. And of course, uh, people such as yourself, child advocacy centers and child and youth advocacy um, right, across, um, right across the country. Um, how, do we get, how do we get all of you involved with the mental health professionals, the assessors? Um, how, do we get, how do we get all of you involved with the mental health professionals, the assessors? Um, because you're seeing these same young people, these same families. Um, and you know that there's uh, litigation going on, you know that child welfare is going on, how can you be part of this process um, and that you need to be engaged as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of the summary of some of these various pathways. Um, so there is growing recognition that not all the interventions work the same across the family justice system. Um, you know, I've always said that um, if, when you're a child, it all depends on what province and territory you live in. Uh, not all provinces and territories have all the same services. Um, and that creates a real challenge for families because families in Alberta shouldn't be treated any differently in the family just land in Labrador. Um, these are the same families that need the same kind of services, but yet they're not equal right across the country. There needs to be early assessment and targeted approaches, the ones that I mentioned earlier, to help differentiate um, the services based on need. Um, not all families are high conflict, so you need to identify those immediately from those that are more low or moderate, who perhaps all they need is a parenting information program or to be able to sit down um, with a mediator. And these differ differential approaches have the promise of actually being much more efficient and a better use of um, scarce resources um, right across the country. So there's still a lot of variation by professional backgrounds to what is useful or not in terms of services. There's a lot of variation on services. There's a lot of variation on what's important for good outcomes for children and families in particular. And the response is based on individual experiences on and hope versus empirical support. Um, I often sometimes read uh, parenting recommendations that are very aspirational. You know, parents shouldn't say bad things towards one another. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a really nice statement to make, but how do you back it up? You're not, you're not in those parents' homes. How are you going to be able to monitor it, evaluate it, and more importantly, do some follow-up? Um, I'm a strong supporter of um, follow-up in all of these cases. So we actually need a, a new sort of a next generation of research that is very interdisciplinary and crosses both practice and, uh, and, and policy. Um, right. And that's sort of my presentation um, for, the, for the day. I'm going to turn off the, um, the PowerPoint so I can see if there are any questions. As I said, I'd be more than happy to send articles um, to those who are, uh, who are interested um, in, some of, in some of this work. Um, so I'm going to stop the sharing right now. And I'm going to turn to um, some of the some of the questions. Sorry. I, um, so uh, the PowerPoint is available through Boost. Um, if anybody is looking for any additional articles, please e email me. Uh, additional articles, please e email me. Uh, exactly what uh, which ones you would like. Um, what, uh, Tammy asks, who would be the source for triaging? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, agencies need to sort that out. Um, typically, it starts at intake. 
um, in terms of how every agency operates and how parents are coming in. Um, I can certainly send out the, um, the, one of the assessment models that can be used as a way of triaging. And then the eight, but there has to be services. Um, once you triage a family, there needs to be services to sort of back that up. Um, and that would need to be in every, um, in every city. So it would be good for agencies to, uh, to get on board with one another to be able to do that. Um, I'm just going up to see if there's any other questions. Uh, a lot of people, the documents, I'm not sure which, what people are referring to when they say documents. If you're talking about articles, um, I'd be more than happy to send them but you would have to tell me which articles that you're specifically um, referring to, um, whether it's the literature on high conflict or the different, uh, the different models. Um, and I think those are the, all the questions I've seen so far. A lot of you are asking for these documents, so I'm assuming the documents are um, are the articles. Um, and again, I'd be happy to send them to you if you can. Uh, e if you could please email me, and I'll send them to you um, as soon as I can. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. We're at about uh, quarter to two. We still have about 15 minutes. Um, do people have any other questions? with respect to the PowerPoint, with respect to um, how do we, how to better understand high conflict, how to better triage these services. Um, Maureen asks, are you able to send the PowerPoint presentation? Um, I believe Boost will have it on their YouTube, um, which is also being recorded. Um, so you, you will be able to have the PowerPoint presentation as well as the uh, audio um, of this presentation. Um, Natalie's asking, yes, the literature is asking, yes, the literature and the conflict and the, and the tools. Absolutely. If you, Natalie, if you send me an email, I'd be more than happy to send you that literature and, uh, and the tools that I, uh, that I spoke of. Um, I don't see any, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, when's the best time, here's a, uh, when's the best time for therapy um, to occur? You know, it's a very good question. Um, it all depends on, uh, for me, the issue, the earliest is always the best. Um, even before, even when parents are thinking about separating, about um, perhaps how they're going to say, obviously, how they're going to say this about their children, how they're going to let their children know about it, um, and they might need some help. Um, but the earlier, the better. Um, when children are already having difficulty in school, um, that's already starting to become too late. Um, what's Ra I got another question about what's Rachel's email, and I'm typing it in as we speak. Um, So that's my email, um, so I can email you the materials for whoever uh, would like them. Um, it says, uh, the presentation can't be downloaded from, oops. Something about it can't be downloaded from YouTube. Just, oh, you can email Pearl, um, who will get who will send you a copy of the uh, presentation or Zania Zahar and uh, they'll certainly send it to you.
So Tara, if you could email me, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to send you some of that literature as well. Um, Sergio says that you can download the slides right now um, uh, while the presentation is going on from the uh, Documents tab. Another question, is it safe for children to engage in therapy when parents are involved in litigation? Um, you know, I, I don't know what you mean by safe. Um, children, uh, children need somebody to talk to. Um, but what often happens is that, you know, children are typically seeing a, a therapist and then the therapist find, does find out that there's um, litigation going on and then one parent wants to use that information um, by saying, you know, can you write me a report so I can give it to my lawyer and they'll show it to the judge or you see that other parent is not, you know, is, is, is doing some, is, is having my child engaged in therapy that I don't know anything about. Um, Children need a safe space um, to be able to speak to their therapist in a, in a confidential manner um, and they need to, uh, are going to need some legal advice um, in terms of how much information they're actually going to, uh, they're going to share. Um, and you're right, um, it, is it emotionally safe knowing that their reports may be subpoenaed? Um, you're absolutely right. Um, once you get a subpoena, um, you're going to have to produce those reports and then the issue becomes really how you write those reports and that's something that you need to speak, that's something that the agencies um, need to sort out from a legal perspective uh, what they're going to do with these reports. Uh, courts are very familiar with not wanting to get therapists of children involved uh, because then it no longer becomes a safe place um, for children because then they're going to feel that you know, everything that's been said about them, they've lost all confidentiality, and that becomes another problem. Um, so it, there needs to be a lot of work between the agencies and the parents' agencies and the parents' lawyers. Um, that's if the parents have lawyers, and if it's just the parents of trying to work it out with the, um, with, with the parents. Um, but children do need a place to, 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 to be able to talk about what some of these issues are. Uh, Natalie says, it's hard to get involved with high conflict families as uh, usually my clients are referred once the police or CAS have, has, has been involved. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's like everybody gets invited to the party um, and because every agency has a different mandate and has issues around confidentiality, and the information, nobody sometimes, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. Um, and that's when it's time for uh, someone to take charge, whether it's the assessor um, in charge of the family or someone who is simply, um, uh, who's a, who, who can bring all these different people together um, to sort out what's going on. At the end of the day, you've got children who are, screaming for help because one or both of their parents are engaged in this process um, that's uh, really ne negatively impacting these, these children. Um, if the courts are involved, then hopefully there will be um, an assessment going on. Every province and territory has government assessors um, uh, that provide these services. Um, and those the government services that are free to the people um, that the that they're that are that are using them uh, should be the ones that are taking charge of these families by bringing by bringing all these different um, systems in. Um, got another question: How is an assessor assigned to the family in high conflict cases? Um, it all depends on where if they're in the if system. Every single uh, court has legislation in place in in family law that um, can ask a social worker or a other kind of mental health professional, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, to become involved in to do um, what's called a parenting assessment. Um, and that and then you ask get your the parents then typically. Um, will be um, uh, 
signing releases of information. And this isn't just Ontario um, or Toronto based. This is in every single province. There is legislation um, that provides the court to um, get these experts involved in these high conflict situations. So some of you out there might have been one of those collateral sources where an assessor spoke to you about how the child is um, how the child is doing, um, and one of the articles um, that I did with me um, has all the different pieces of legislation of what they're called in every single province and territory. And if there isn't, I'd certainly be happy to tell you what the legislation is. Um, in your particular province or territory. Um, and also there's quite a number of provinces that have uh, children's lawyers. Uh, the Northwest Territories has children's lawyers, Quebec, Ontario. Um, they're slowly, I think, putting some together in, um, in British Columbia. There are lawyers for children, mostly in child welfare in, Al in Alberta. Um, but they're always engaged with all these different, um, different sources. Um, so I hope I'm answering these questions. Um, but you're all spot on with respect to, um, you know, what do we do with these families? Um, you know, we, we can do a lot more than what we're doing. The problem is than what we're doing. The problem is, is that we're not all talking with one another. Um, and that's why the assessor in particular, who's in charge of these families, if it's court ordered, um, should be inviting everybody together. Um, where the agencies um, who are involved with these families um, should be getting parents to, um, to sign these um, releases so that you can all get on the same page and be able to talk with one another, um, which includes a lot of these um, uh, child and youth advocacy um, agencies where uh, children and families are involved. Um, who is in the best position to coordinate this collaboration? Um, if it's court ordered, it's probably the assessor. If it's the, um, if children are engaged in therapy, um, you know, it might be helpful, as I just said, to get the parents to sign um, uh, releases of information so that uh, all these people can be brought in or at least um, be spoken to on the telephone to get a better sense. But of course, it all depends on what your role and your responsibility is for this family. Um, if it's in the court system, then the best place is, um, is the assessor who's in charge of this. So I'm going to, I've got just a couple of minutes if anybody's got any other um, questions. I've been told I've got about four minutes. I thank you for your attention, and I thank those that have uh, that have asked uh, that have put out these questions. I I hope that I've answered them, and if not, email. So please do feel free to email, and I'm more than happy to send out um, these articles. Um, someone just said it's helpful to know that other jurisdictions have similar programs and responses. Um, to our province and to know other provinces. Oh yeah, these, these high conflict families are a challenge whether you live up in Nunavut to uh, you know, Cape Breton to uh, Kelowna, BC. Um, they're, uh, <laughs> they're the same families and yet um, we don't want to seem to wrap our arms around them uh, because it's, it, they're challenging to work with. There's no question. And that's why I, I sort of called the, uh, the presentation that it's not just about um, the, uh, the challenges, but there's also opportunities with working with these families. And those opportunities um, will, help to, will help children in any event. So I think I'm going to uh, close the session now. Um, again, I thank you all and uh, have a good day.